to say a welcome to everyone. Um, and I'm just so delighted to be able to be part of the second launch. I was at the Cape Town launch and now I'm on the Zoom launch. Um, and I was also very privileged to be Biddy's editor for the book. So I feel like I have shares in this project as well. Um, it was a real joy to work on this project with Biddy over an intensive period of a year. Um, and it was for me a wonderful um, exchange of minds and hearts and of skill. And I think when we, well, for those of you who weren't at previous launches, and I think a couple have been, so forgive us if there's some repetition um, for you. Uh, but Biddy has produced a beautifully crafted, extremely well researched and highly readable book. For those of you who haven't seen it, you have a treat in store. So we're just going to give you some little tasters from the book. And I'm going to say a little bit at the beginning and then really hand over to Biddy with some prompting questions. So essentially, Journey Under the Southern Cross, and I think it's appropriate to hold it up for those who haven't seen it. So Biddy, hold up your copy so everyone can have a, a little look at the cover. That's what um, we're talking about today. It tells the story of the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur from their foundation in the 18th century in France by two French women. One, a peasant woman, Julie Billiard, and the other, a noble woman, Francoise Blaine de Bourdin. And I'm going to put up a couple of pictures because that's always a good way to to get some attention. So I'm going to show a couple of pictures. The first, um, and I hope you can see, I'll put it on slide view, um, paintings of Julie Billiard and of Francoise. And then a modern day version of Julie's home, which was in a little village of Couvely in France. It was obviously restored and, and um, rebuilt in some way. And then uh, back to, that's a lovely picture of Julie, um, the smiling, the smiling sister. And then that's Francoise home, um, the Chateau um, de Baudin. And it was, it became a hospice, interestingly, um, and then was burned down in 1929. So from its early beginnings in France, the sisters quite soon moved to Belgium and the book tells why, and I'm not giving all of this away because you need to read the book. Um, and from there, the congregation spread to other parts of the world and moved, I'm going to put up to where we moved to, um, all over as far afield as we can see. It didn't quite get to Cape Town, but it certainly shows us in Southern Africa. So Biddy's story moves quite quickly and she tells the story of the sisters who lived and ministered in Southern Africa, in Zimbabwe and South Africa in the era post-1975. And she'll give a bit of explanation as to why she started there. And then the story goes on to describe the ministries that developed in various locations in Zimbabwe and South Africa during that period. So I'm going to ask Biddy first of all, just to speak to why she started her book rather differently. She began the book not with the sisters,
Sisters of Notre Dame specifically, but rather giving a short overview of the story of religious life for women as it has evolved over the centuries. And I'd like Biddy to actually say why, Biddy, why did you decide that that was a good starting point for your story? I think I um, felt after I had read in the course of doing the research over four years for this book, I came across a book by Joanne McNamara called Sisters in Arms. And it gave the overview of how religious life, the life of consecrated women has developed probably over 1700 years from the time of the Desert Mothers through the time of the monasteries and then the men mendicants in the 13th century and then in the 15th and 16th century with the Urshaline sisters and the Loretto sisters, the Mary Ward sisters. That consecrated life, a life of living the three vows, poverty, chastity, celibacy, and obedience has drawn women of all different, I want to say shapes and sizes, <laughs> um, of all different backgrounds and really into the following of Jesus, of the risen Jesus. We're in Easter time, so it's important to say that. And finally, in that life of consecration to the risen Jesus and Jesus's mission, which was, as we say it in um, Notre Dame, to bring the good news of God's goodness to people. Um, when I read that book, and then I also was reading Sandra Schneider's, who has is an American IHM sister, and she's written three massive tones on what that religious life is today, she calls it ministerial religious life. And I felt that, um, well, it gave a lot of meaning to me. I felt suddenly I was at the end, this, this end, 2022, 2021 end, of a stream of amazing women who have in, their, in very different ways and in evol evolving ways, tried to bring the mission of Jesus into their different contexts. And so it seemed to me to be important to bring, to give an overview at the beginning, because some people have no idea of what this strange phenomenon is, and they would think it a strange phenomenon. And then that's my chapter one. And in chapter two, I move on to tell the story of the friendship between the peasant woman, Julie Biard, who was canonized in 1969, and the aristocrat, Francoise Bland de Bourdon, who was an amazing friendship, um, brought the congregation of the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur into being. And Julie was told to get out of Amiens where the congregation was founded. The bishop told her to move out. So there is a sort of um, tradition that we have of standing firm on principle and on what we believe. And instead of being the Sisters of Notre Dame of Amiens, we are the Sisters of Notre Dame of Namur in Belgium because the Bishop of Belgium, when Julie was expelled from Namur, was um, invited her to Namur. And in chapter two, after giving a short overview of the story of Julie and Francois, I begin to tell the story of how the congregation of Notre Dame has unfolded over 
1804 we were founded, so it's 218 years. And from Namur in Belgium, we have spread to um, Britain, England and Scotland, to the United States, to Japan, to South Africa and Zimbabwe, Kenya, Congo, Nigeria, um, and in South America to Peru and Brazil. So I think that's my answer to your first question. Mm. Is there something else I should mm. add, Mary? No, I think that gives a very helpful, helpful background to, to the framing of your book. But I think we move quite quickly in your book to Vatican II as a, a pivotal moment in the church and how a, a number of changes were um, spawned as a result of Vatican II. And I think it will be interesting for you to talk a little bit about how um, the, the kinds of changes in religious life that emerged out of that watershed moment. And I'm thinking particularly if you could focus on the congregation, perhaps how organizational change, change in ministry, return to the charism of your foundress, foundresses. Um, so how did, what was the kind of turmoil going on and the change that was being wrought in the congregation um, as a result of Vatican II? Is that too big a question? <laughs> take no, as I much as you, take as much as, as you want to. Yeah. Um, I think Vatican II was a call to Catholics around the world to um, shape up, to become more relevant to the world that we were living in in the 1960s. So we were all called, all baptized Catholics were called to massive renewal um, of their thinking, of their practice from Vatican II. And I think religious around the world, of all the groups in the church, took that call more seriously than anyone, any other group. I'm not sure that that's my personal thought. I think that's a kind of general feeling that the women religious particularly took terribly seriously the document addressed to them, Perfecti Caritatis, that came out of Vatican II. And that document called us to go back to our roots, to go back to our particular charism, the gift that our congregation, having been recognized by the church, was to give the church. And Sisters of Notre Dame and many sisters, many, many religious women took that call very seriously. And we certainly did in Notre Dame. We had religious congregations every six years or every four years, depending, have what they call a general chapter, which is like their parliament. And we had a special general chapter. There were two sessions of it in the late 60s. And that chapter where representatives from all Sisters of Notre Dame around the world were present, that chapter sent, certainly sent our two delegates, Sister Veronica Chapman and Sister Mary McLeish, they came back with a totally different mindset. And we were a fairly small group in, at that time between um, what was then Rhodesia and South Africa. There would have been about 70 of us, maybe in five or six con communities. And we certainly took the renewal as did other parts of the congregation to heart. And it did turn our life upside down. Um, one of the things that we did in Southern Africa, the Sisters of Rhodesia and South Africa, in 1971, we drew up for ourselves a mission statement. I think we, we were told at that stage, we were fir the first part of the congregation to draw up a mission statement. And in that mission statement, we called ourselves 
to examine the context in which we were both countries were living and to go to the margins to make because we had been founded to bring the good news god's goodness to those on the edges of society and as a result of that um, vision statement mission statement we gave up our white schools um, because we knew that the pupils in them in South Africa could go to equally good places of education. And we decided that we would look for where the margins were. And as a result of that, uh, three sisters went and started a, a mission in a remote part of Botswana and chapter eight of the book tells the story of that. Really, most of the chapters of the book un unfold through the lives, because I've tried to tell the stories of the sisters who were involved. Um, I've tried to tell their stories. And in telling their stories, tried to highlight the huge changes that came about from living in institutions, to moving into small communities where we all had to share responsibilities for cooking and for shopping and for cleaning and for doing all the things that many women have to do as part of their lives that hadn't been part of our lives in the institutions. Um, our style of living changed radically. Our understanding of obedience we didn't have a mother superior or sister superior to whom we went to to ask when we had our needs. We had to start talking to each other and sharing the responsibility for the decisions we make in our small groups. Our living of the vow of poverty actually also, I think, became, we don't, we're not, in Southern Africa, in Africa, you can hardly say religious are living a vow a poverty because poverty in Africa is so different from the way we live. We live, we share the resources we have. We don't own them personally. There's a, a care for and a responsible use of, and there's an accountability to each other for the way we are living. So, from the very core, our lives were turned upside down, so to speak. And I hope made much more relevant and made us feel that we were like ordinary people in the world. I remember the first time I had to go and do the community shopping in Pick and Pay in Plumstead. And I remember looking at the other, first time I pushed, a trolley with goods in it, and suddenly feeling I was, I'd been reduced to normality, <laughs> thank God, or upgraded to normality. Um, and I had to do the things that other people were doing as part of their everyday lives. So it certainly changed our lives and it changed, and there's a chapter in the book that explains the changes in governance. I actually started that chapter in 1899 when we first came to what was then um, Rhodesia and how our way of organizing ourselves, our way of living this vow of obedience, of accepting responsibility, of living in accountability, how that in um, a little over a hundred years has changed so radically. I just want to say, why did I begin the story in 1975? Um, we, our story in Southern Africa actually began in 1899, but Sister Patricia Kay fortunately did the story from 1899 up to the mid 70s. And I think, Mary, you probably remember, wasn't she? Was she over your headmistress at some stage? You remember her from Constantia. Um, 
Pat and I helped Pat in the lot with her last few chapters. That was in the late 70s and early 80s. And so in this book, I tried to pick up her book was called Notre Dame under the Southern Cross. And I tried to make this a continuation of that story by calling it Journey under the Southern Cross. That's helpful, helpful again, helpful background. But it is interesting that, that your story is pitched within the very fraught times, the political transition times, both in Zimbabwe, just during independence or pre and during independence, and then the struggle, the apartheid struggle in South Africa and post independence. Um, so, but you, your, your congregation and decisions in Southern Africa were impacted by changes in the church, but equally by changes going on in society. And I'm interested, and I, I would wonder if that would be a good, good point for you to pick up the story of how you think the congregation down here impacted back on the struggles that were going on in the context within which you were ministering. And then equally, how the context impacted on decisions you were making. So there's a kind of iterative relationship between context and decisions being made. Um, by the congregation. Would you, would you like to pick up on some of that? Sure. Um, I'm going to start with Zimbabwe, which was in 1975, Rhodesia. And we had had um, a school in a remote part of the country, in Barkwe. We'd actually gone to a mission to uh, Mpandani in 1899. And then we'd Mbakwe had been opened about four or five years after that. And Mbakwe became, it had an African primary school for the children from the area. And from the 1920s, it became a large boarding school for children of mixed race. Our colored population in Rhodesia, that was. And in 1965, we'd been invited to open a school in Pamula Township, outside Bulawayo, a, a secondary school for boys and girls. So in a way, in Zimbabwe, our sisters, and they, I have to say there was a clinic a, and a maternity hospital on the mission in Zimbabwe. In Rhodesia, our sisters were never, ever worked for the settlers in the colonial setup. They were always working um, with the people who were at the receiving end of, even though uh, Rhodesia never had apartheid, it certainly had a separate way of treating people of color. And our, our mission in Mbakwe in 1978 was attacked by freedom fighters, and it was a mission that we worked on with the Marion Hill brothers and, and a manager from Marion Hill father. And the two brothers were shot dead in 1978. And the mission was closed. And the, the clinic was also closed very, very quickly. And that put a kind of, was a big abrupt ending to what we'd been involved in for since 1899. Some of the sisters who had been working on the mission went back to England and stayed there. Some of them came back, few of them came back, but they came back into a very different Rhodesia in the 1970s. And in 1980, uh, Mugabe became the first black president of Zimbabwe with great hopes for that country. And we were privileged in, in, to have sisters coming from the States and from Britain offering not to come out for life, but to come out for periods of maybe five, 10 years 
um, maybe two years to work with the little handful of women who were left in Zimbabwe. And of course, we never got back to institutional, or well, we hadn't really had to, Mbake may have been more of an institution, but they lived in small communities and they really went to the edges. And I'm not going to go on the story, the book tells you about that. I know Anne Raynal is watching this, is a part of this. And Anne was a medical, she's a past pupil of ours from Grunstadt. And Anne was medical officer, acting deputy medical officer of health in Bulawayo during the years of the Bukuhurandi. And Anne had told me that she had made notes of what she had experienced. And when the book was published, I asked if she wouldn't send me those notes. And those notes form an appendix of what life was really, what the terrible situation of that slaughter of so many thousands of Matabili people by organized by Mugabe. So that's part of that story. And um, it's a little different in a sense from what was happening here. We had given up our two remaining white schools, Constantia and Kronstadt. And we, were, we kept our school in the township in Kronstadt. We were involved in a, town, a school in Soweto. Our sisters went to Swaziland, Eswatini, as it's now known. Another three sisters went to Botswana. And we tried to, in the ministries we, we chose, to work in those areas of church that were outreach to the poor and the people living on the margins. And I don't, yes, I don't know that we made such an impact on society. I think the context shaped us and made us very different people because we were involved in work for justice. We were involved with um, work with homeless people. We were involved in um, training in the different dioceses, training and catechetics. Um, our life was very, very different. And because we mingled and worked with, alongside of, collaborating with the laity and with teachers of other, religious of other congregations, uh, it's hard to say how we changed. It impacted us and the way we lived enormously. And I think certainly in South Africa, we were with the, we would some of us would call ourselves activists with a social justice activists that were agitating and trying to bring about change in the apartheid situation. And perhaps it's for others to reflect back to you how we have and how society has been impacted by you. So thanks for your modesty, Buddy. Um, I wonder if this is a good moment just to pause um, in good pedagogy and Buddy is an educationalist. We give time for the, the audience to think and reflect and maybe respond back. So maybe just take a minute or two and if you want to post a question or a comment in the chat, that's one way. Otherwise, I'll just take a couple of hands up if anybody wants to respond in any way to what Biddy has been saying. But just take a moment just to think a little bit about what she has shared so far. Bernie? Yes. Let Bernie me, Hallam. Can I see, see hands up? Bernie, hi. Hello, Bernie. No, it, so it's Bonnie speaking about Bernie. Yes, Bernie. <laughs> yeah. On page 247, there's a picture of Bernie Mallon, who's with us here today, um, and the staff of the school. Mm. And a little, <laughs> 
and a very humorous little altercation she had. Bernie, do you want to tell us about that? You'll need to unmute Bernie. Yes, I was the principal of, of St. Martin de Porres in Orlando West um, for some time, I think three years. Um, and it was during the time of the riots and the Zulu marches and the taxi wars and heaven knows what. I used to have to check before I left home if I could get a route through sometimes. Um, and the taxi drivers used to come and warn me when there were riots happening close to the school. And I used to have to make decisions about dismissing the children very quickly. Um, and Sister Trays was the financial manager of the school. And she was my teacher when I was in grade seven. And um, I dismissed the school one day, uh, very suddenly, on a warning. And um, she wasn't around, so I didn't even dream of consulting her because I was the principal. And um, she complained about that. So and then I asked her if she still thought I was in grade seven or whether I had grown up a bit or whatever it was, something rude anyway. <laughs> we were great friends. I mean, it just helped to clarify the roles, the management roles in the school, actually. So that was one of my little adventures. <laughs> Thanks for telling the story, Bernie. Thank you. Anybody else want to make a comment or ask any questions of Biddy before she carries on? Okay. Don't see any hands up. Can I just say one, one minute? We, yes. I had purchased the book, Journey Under the Southern Cross, and I shared it with Roseberry Walk, who was in Zimbabwe, and she greatly appreciated reading that book and we've now given it to the archives here in Ohio. Thank you. I see Madeline has raised her hand. Thank you. Just come in because yes. I can't see you. Uh, this is Mary Lynn from Howick. Hi, Mary I just Lynn. want to, uh, yes, hello, Mary, and everyone else that I know and that, that those I don't know. Um, I just want to say how grateful I was to Biddy uh, she uh, and I was um, the secretary of the Justice and Peace Commission in the Bishops' Conference in Pretoria, and Biddy came and worked with me as a co-secretary for I can't remember how many years. But the first thing she said was, "We've got to get this office sorted out. It's a mess, <laughs> and it was a mess. My, my administrative abilities are not the greatest." thing and and Biddy has wonderful administrative skills so we, we I think we ran a, um, a very good partnership in the commission from the time she arrived there so thank you Biddy. Oh, that's lovely thanks Mary Lynn and then just posted in the chat um, from someone you certainly impacted my life hugely while being our English teacher. Thank you, Sister Biddy. And then from Mariandre, I just want to say it's good seeing other SNDs de, de Namur across the world because we've always felt supported by our sisters. And then from Anne Raynal, well done, Bernie. <laughs> Anybody else before I, I ask? Yes, Teresita. Hello. Hello. Simply thank you again, Biddy, or again, thank you. And especially with what you did today at Mary's prompt to describe why you began with consecrated life, because so many people don't know who we are as consecrated women. And the rest of the book tells everybody who reads it 
This is who we are. Thank you. Lovely, Krista. Lovely comment. Anybody else? Okay. Right, Biddy, have you had a bit of a breather? Can, can you pick up again? Yes. <laughs> okay. So I would like you um, to explain in your final chapter. So the chapters in, in the middle, you've kind of covered and given a bit of a summary, but your final chapter reads, the, the title reads, Our Journey Under the Southern Cross, Her Story Continues. Now, this is a shift in language from your use of the word history in the first chapter. So why her story? This is the, the, the language shift. And what impact do you think this book might have on disrupting the very dominant, often patriarchal narrative of church in Southern Africa? So can you become a little more contentious right now? <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> I have to say that I learned a lot from Marilyn for those years that I worked with her. Um, I think she pushed, and she's not the only one that has pushed me to go to beyond my boundaries. So thank you, Marilyn. But yes, Mary, Mary, in the last um, 10, 12 years, I've been the archivist for the Sisters of Notre Dame in first of all in Zimbabwe and South Africa, and now just in South Africa. And I've had, had the privilege of doing a number of publications. I was able to edit a, a diary that our very, one of our very first sisters kept, an illustrated diary she kept of her first four years in, um, uh, at Mpandani. And we worked with the Jesuits there. And when that book was read by a couple of, that diary was read by a couple of Jesuits, one of them said to me, Biddy, the Sisters of Notre Dame certainly come out of that diary as much more compassionate and much more human than the Jesuits of the time did. That was Chris Chatteris from Cape Town, who's now in Cape Town, who made that comment to me. Anyway, I also collected stories. Um, I had a privilege in 19, uh, 2008, 2009 of going and interviewing about 60 different women, including Rosemary Wack Teresita, who had been, and it was uh, Sean, who was speaking about Rosemary Wack, who had been in our uh, Southern Africa and getting their stories. And when I came to publish or print those stories and make them available to the Sisters of Notre Dame, I began to look for context, books about the context. And I discovered that the history of the church in Southern Africa, maybe elsewhere as well, has been written by men. And very often the history is all about all the churches that this father or that father or that bishop built. And maybe at the end of the chapter, there's a paragraph, the Sisters of Mercy or the Dominican Sisters, the Sisters of Notre Dame worked in this diocese as well. And I began to ask questions about that. And I realized in the archives, in the libraries of institutions in Southern Africa, that is what exists. The story of the church, the story of the development of Catholicism, Christianity, education, written very differently and through the eyes of men. And I actually got quite passionate about it and shared my consternation with several religious congregations in South Africa who are much have always been much larger than us and have worked even we weren't the earliest to come the Assumption Sisters came out in 1848 
and the Holy Family Sisters, the Dominican, various Dominican sisters. And they haven't put their story out. They haven't put it together and made it available. And so that kind of gave me a bit of a, and it still does. And sisters have heard me say, if we all wrote our stories just of what we've done in Southern Africa, it would be an alternative history because the sisters have been in remote places and have worked with people, have been educators and nurses. They've worked on the ground with people. They haven't built churches and institutions in their memory. So you can hear, I can even hear my voice has changed a little bit. The, 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 um, kind of got quite passionate about this and feel we have a responsibility. We can't blame people out there because they haven't got the story if we haven't put it out. So it's become a passion and a bit of a mission of mine to prod the other religious congregations to write their story, which is her story. I think too, in writing the story, uh, if we're very true, we will have to show how there have been times that we have been um, in conflict with the powers, the ecclesial powers that be. It hasn't always been hanky-dory and smooth sailing. And I was, when I thought that earlier this morning, I tried to think of a time when I really challenged, um, used the authority I had when I was director of the Catholic Institute of Education here in Johannesburg. Um, I had a big fallout with Bishop Orsmond because he was the local bishop and he was a dear, good, loving man. But I had a sense of where the priorities of the institutional church were at the time. And in the Catholic Institu Institute of Education in the 90s, we were able to channel large sums of money from the European Union, from funders, Catholic funders around the world for the improvement of Catholic schools. And I remember an amount of money came into our bank accounts in Johannesburg for the material improvement of schools in Johannesburg Diocese, including the one that Bernie was principal of for three years. And we got together the principals and we got together the managers. There were managers looking after the finances. And we talked about what were the most needed um, physical changes, plant changes, and very often they were toilet blocks. That seems to be a story in South Africa. Schools need to have proper toilet blocks. So we had a plan and Bishop Orsman phoned me and said he heard that there was this money available for the diocese, diocesan schools, and he wanted to put it in, into his bank account or into the diocesan bank account. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm not able to do that because I am accountable to the funders and I have to make sure, Bishop, that they, the money goes where it's supposed to go. And Bishop Orsman was very, very angry with me. And um, a priest, one of his consultants told me that <laughs> he would like to get rid of me if he possibly could, because how could I, a, a sister, a woman, stand up and tell him where money should be spent in his diocese. Now, that I just remembered. I don't know that I put that story in the book, by the way. But anyway, I remembered that this morning. And I recalled other places that I have recorded in the book where um, the way we worked and did our work um, didn't meet didn't fall in with 
the powers that be. And I think particularly of the mission at Matoko in Zimbabwe, we had two Notre Dame sisters and an IHM sister from the States who is still alive, working on a very remote mission. And there was, the sisters were horrified at the use of corporal punishment. And they tried to work with the staff, with the headmaster, and get rid of this, find alternative ways of discipline. And to cut a very long story short, that school, for various reasons, ended up with strikes and protests. And the Archbishop of Harare came himself to the school and did an investigation. And the upshot of it was that he blamed the Sisters of Notre Dame and the IHM sister for introducing other ways of disciplining for losing the kind of control that had been in the school. Um, I don't know how much detail I've put that story in, but I know the sisters did a lot of soul searching and felt that they couldn't continue when there was such a, a, a clash of ideal, um, um, pedagogy um, and they wouldn't take accept responsibility for that, but they decided that maybe if, if it was just going to be such a clash and they were going to be blamed um, and the, the authorities were wanting to keep on with corporal, and it was quite brutal corporal punishment at times, um, they couldn't see themselves continuing. So in some ways we have stood up to the authorities. I don't think perhaps we've done it enough. I think our consciousness is growing in this area of what's right and what's wrong. But certainly I think we have a, a record that needs her story and a lot of hers, the story of a lot of hers needs to be recorded and shared more widely in this country and probably elsewhere as well. So thank you on behalf of non-religious, your sisters who are non-religious for, for telling the story and for your clarion call to other religious congregations to do the same, because I think it enriches and serves all of us in the church. Um, you're having done this, so thank you. But Biddy, just to, I suppose we've got to start drawing this to, to a, a close, but the uncomfortable and difficult question about where to from now, as the numbers of your congregation in Southern Africa are diminishing, um, where do you see religious life as a life form being called, um, is it dying? Or is spirit calling it to express and incarnate in different ways? So I wonder if you could tackle it in whatever way you like, um, this question. I think some of us, some congregations and some parts of congregations are coming to conclusion I remember about 15 or 20 years ago, Bonnie's brother, Larry, a redemptorist, ran a workshop in Johannesburg and there were about 150 sisters there. And he reflected back to us that the life cycle of any, of the average life cycle of congregations in the church is 200 years. Now there are some that have gone on, Benedictines and Dominicans and Augustinians, and there are some that are much, much older than that. But there are hundreds of religious congregations that have come to birth, done in a context, done what they are, were called to do, lived their charism, and the time comes when other people are not joining them, and maybe there's a need for a different charism, a different way. Now, 
in, uh, in Notre Dame, South Africa is certainly one part of the congregation which is coming. We are not getting new members and we haven't had new members. Other parts are uh, sisters in Congo and in Nigeria and um, Kenya. There are other parts of our congregation where African women are joining and in substantial, I don't know, substantial numbers, enough to say that there's a, there's a future for the next so many decades. But we can't say that. We know we are coming to an end. And how do we ensure that what we have put in place that's worth continuing somehow continues into the future? And that's where I think having associates, having lay people working with us, in fact, handing our institutions over to the laity who run it, often run them very much more efficiently than we may have done. That is perhaps where, on a practical level, where our future is in South Africa. But I don't believe, having read Joanne McNamara's book, and other, other stories as well, other books. I don't believe this life form will actually disappear. It hasn't disappeared for 2,000 years. There have been many mutations, no, not 2,000 years, maybe 1,800 years. There have been many mutations. And I think perhaps we are in the church at a, at a moment of looking to see what's What's emerging? What, what's the new, I mean, our church in some ways, parts of it need to implode as more quickly than other parts, perhaps. So what is the future? I like the spirit will be with us all time. And I do think that, I don't think religious life as such consecrated life will disappear completely. I think it's going to have different forms and different a different shape in the future. And I think maybe some congregations have done their work and will no longer be around. But I think the gifts that are given to people to build the kingdom of God here on earth those gifts will be assured by the Holy Spirit as we move into the future. So in my last chapter, I try and raise some perhaps uncomfortable questions. Um, where are we going? And the book is about the sisters in Zimbabwe and South Africa. And Zimbabwe does have new members, a small number. So even in this part, the, the there's a different um, shape to it. We are not one unit anymore, but there's a different shape and a different pattern emerging. I don't know, but it doesn't worry me anymore. It used to worry me immensely. I actually think there's a time and a place and a gift. And I think if we look underneath, we know in South Africa, there are huge challenges all over the place. But somehow the spirit is stirring among people of goodwill and not only Catholics, not only Christians, it's much, the spirit of God is much bigger than that. And so it's kind of wondering what's going to emerge, um, what's going to come, where people are faithful, where people ask the right questions and where people listen, and work with each other. What a good way to end. Biddy, thank you. It feels like a there's a, a sense of resolve, but also in handing over. It, and it doesn't matter because spirit, spirit will do her work wherever and however. Thank you. Thanks, Biddy. And I'm going to hand over back to Bonnie just to close and talk about where we can get the book. 
Okay, so, um, oh, uh, okay, Biddy, we, we need to put your email address into the chat. Oh. <laughs> um, so that um, people can, or your phone number, so that people can contact you for the book. Okay. Okay. So have a look in the chat. Um, Biddy, I, I just want to say thank you. Particularly, okay, the, whole, the whole presentation was absolutely beautiful between you and Mary, the way you worked it together. But I just loved your wise words of hope at the end now. I read deeply hopeful in such a hopeless time. So um, I feel deeply heart warmed with those beautiful wise words you've given us now. Thank you, Biddy, and thank you for enriching our lives with your with your whole being as well as your book. It's for me, it's a honor and a pleasure to be your friend. Is there anybody else who would like to say something quickly before we close? There we go, Bernie. Bernie? Yeah, I just wanted to comment that, you know, the sisters are elderly and they may pass on, but the gift they have given will never pass on. The gift always stands, and that gives people hope and strength because those are formative gifts that they've left behind. So, and one generation passes the mark unobtrusively perhaps to another. So I don't think, uh, I think like the religious life will go on in some form. I feel so sad to, to close <laughs> because it's been such a special, very, very special time today. Very, very special. Is there anyone else who'd like to say something before we do? I would like the last word, maybe. <laughs> and uh, really, I speak as a, a sister of Notre Dame. I speak as one who's lived alongside Biddy for I'm not going to say how many years because we were at school together here. And so all she talked about is our life in Southern Africa. And I want to pay tribute to the work she's done for us in recording the last 40 years and recording it in the way she has. So I speak for myself personally, but I'm sure I speak for all our forebears who went before us and are in our graveside here in our cemetery. Thank you, Biddy. And Sybil, I saw your hand up. Oh no, I've I've sent Biddy a message just to oh. say that it was really wonderful. Yeah. Very touching and very moving. Thank you, Biddy. Great courage. Yeah, courage. Yeah, yeah. Yes, <laughs> courage. Okay, everybody. Thank you for blessing us this afternoon, Biddy and Mary. And um, we've, we've got, I normally have the coffee with God once a month, but we've actually got an, another one next Saturday. So if any of you are interested in joining, um, uh, send Biddy the email because, you know, she gets the emails for coffee with God. Next week's also going to be very interesting uh, with Elizabeth Martini, who is uh, talking about, oh, Elizabeth, can I ask you just to give us a, yes. a minute on and describing what it is? Sure. sure. And first of all, thank you very much, uh, Biddy, for your presentation and for um, Mary, for your facilitation. Uh, next week, I'm going to be presenting with Sue Rakosi in conversation about a research I did a couple of years ago. The name of it is a physical disability 
and images of God. And I will be giving briefly uh, the context, the background on theology of Elizabeth Johnson, the psychology of Carl Jung, and something briefly about disability. But the thrust or the main focus is uh, more practical about how artwork was used in this research, in their search for images of God, and to facilitate integration of, the, of um, their disability and um, how it can be used actually in the spiritual journey for anyone. So that's a taste. You see, I needed Mary, to, I needed Elizabeth to describe that. I don't have the words for it that she does. <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you again, Biddy and Mary and EJ. And bless all of you and have a lovely evening. Or